Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Hugh Hutchison. I am president of the International Lightning Class, and I'd like to welcome you to the next edition of the Lightning Class Fridays at 5. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different than what we've done over the last uh, couple of weeks, um, but it's something that actually highlights one of the uh, unique elements of our class. Over the last several weeks, we've heard from world-class sailors, uh, sailors who sail lightnings that would be standouts in any class, and they have uh, they discussed with us how to, uh, how to go really fast and the tactics of going fast in the right place. Um, today, we're going to display one of the unique elements of this class and delve into a little bit of our class history. Uh, we have a rich history, and it will be uh, interesting to hear from some of the people that know it best. Uh, you're going to hear from Bob Astro, who has been instrumental in organizing our classic boat section. Uh, you're going to hear from Mike Siebert, who has personally constructed a wood lightning. And we're going to hear from Dave Nichols, who's going to talk about a lifetime association with constructing lightning. And for those of you who are uninitiated with respect to the class website, uh, I hope all of you get a chance to check in there, check in soon and often. There's lots of good information there. Uh, www.lightningclass.org, which um, is updated virtually daily. So uh, if you're not familiar with that, um, I'd suggest you go ahead and make yourself familiar with it. Um, next, got to have a commercial. Um, the Lightning class depends on its members. And even though we are, uh, we are not doing a great deal of racing these days, one of the things that's important to recognize and today highlights that is that the Lightning class is not limited to discussion of racing, but it, the lightning class is there to support all of the different elements of the class. So we'd like you to consider paying your class dues if you have not. If you are solely involved in the um, uh, classic group, please, we need your support as well. So uh, I would request that each of you, uh, if you have not maintain the current membership, please consider making a uh, payment and joining as soon as possible. So for today's presentation, I would like to start by introducing Bob Astro. Bob is our Vice President for Classic Boats, um, and he is somebody that we are many of us familiar with because his wood boat Pandora, number 7603, is one that he continues to race and race competitively. Uh, he has recently showed up in a brand new Allen, but I'm sure he has not abandoned his roots in the classic boat division. So uh, I'm pleased to be able to introduce Bob and say, Bob, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure for those people who have the modern sale with the modern boat group if you have curiosity and it's a great discussion group we have online uh, at the website shown on the screen um, you can join the class the classic dash lightning group on groups.io we have a vibrant discussion uh, all the time it's it's uh, more like a listserv or used to be yahoo groups um, all kinds of information the best resource if you have questions, if you're storing an old boat, wood or fiberglass, it's a great source uh, of information to get all your questions answered. We have a very active group um, and we love uh, hearing from everybody. Uh, we love most of all seeing pictures of the work they're doing on their boats. Uh, so please feel free to join us anytime. Thank you. Uh, I also want to plug the ILCA store, which is on the website. And again, I, uh, there are probably some people listening here who are not that familiar with the class website. We have a store where we sell all kinds of clothing items, 
you could buy a set of plans for the boat and uh, you don't it's always good to have a set of plans particularly if you have a woody um, regardless it does, you don't have to be building a boat it's a good thing to have and it's a pretty interesting thing to look at I, I certainly have a copy uh, in fact I just scanned a piece of the plans that had a new face mask made with the lightning plans on them uh, there are a number of books available um, a wide variety of books uh, on the Lightning Class website, one of which is Plug Nickel, which I'm going to plug right here um, because it's relevant to our, our guest today, Dave Nichols. Um, this boat, which was restored by Joel Thurtell, many of you will remember Joel. He used to write the weekly, uh, monthly article in Flashes about uh, old boats and humorous stories about working on the boats. Um, and acquiring all kinds of merchandise for the boats. Um, it is available on the website, and it's, uh, it's good nighttime reading. Uh, so I would encourage all of you to check it out. Uh, this boat, Plug Nickel, was the plug used to build the molds at Nichols and Holman. And uh, Dave's going to get into a little bit of that later. Um, helping me today is Mike Seibert. As you said, Mike is one of our most active Classic Lightning participants. He has two lightnings. Uh, he, I first met Dave, uh, Mike maybe 12 years ago, 10 years ago, um, and he was looking to build a lightning, and a group of us encouraged that, but we also talked him into buying a used lightning um, so he could get started sailing the boats before he completed his construction. It took him a little longer than he expected to build the boat. But you can see a picture of it here. He completed it last year and sailed it in our annual Classic Boat Regatta. Um, it is spectacular. Um, and Dave, Mike met Dave, uh, I'm not sure how they met, but uh, Dave provided, let's say, at least hundreds of emails of uh, questions and answers to Mike in helping him build that boat. Um, the boat could actually be called the last, you know, wooden Nichols boat. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our, our guest of honor here today, Dave Nichols. Um, he, this is a photo, actually, of, of Dave and uh, Brian and Louie receiving the Lifetime, Achieve the Lifetime Membership Awards in the Lightning class. Uh, Brian and Louie uh, actually accepting the awards posthumously to George and, uh, and Herm Nichols, um, and Dave, of course, for himself. Um, today, we're not, uh, we're not gonna get you to the winner mark any faster with what we have to share today. Um, but we are going to learn a lot about from, from somebody who did a lot of work to get you to the Windward Mark faster. Um, Dave Nichols has built, oh, sorry, has built hundreds of lightnings. Um, at Nichols and Holman, we're not sure of the exact count right now, but it was between 25 and 30 boats a year. Uh, later, Dave formed Nichols Boat Works, uh, which constructed almost 600 lightnings. Uh, Laura sent me a list by year, um, and it's, it's a lot of boats. And, uh, and many of the people listening here today have, had, have owned one of those boats. Um, the boats were exceptionally, exceptionally fast and of superior quality, um, great boats. Um, in fact, over a span of about 18 years, uh, the, the Nichols Boat Works boats won the North Americans nine times. Uh, Dave started working at Nichols and Holman in 1954, and he started Nichols Boats in 1981. Um, at this point, I'd like to start uh, with asking uh, Dave a few questions. I'm going to ask just a couple, just a few questions here, then we're going to pass it on to Mike to lead us through uh, pretty much the, the wooden boat era. Uh, the, with Nichols and Holman, and then uh, we're going to transition into some discussion of the, uh, the Nichols Boat Works uh, process. We have a set of uh, slides also to share with you about the concerning the construction of the Nichols Boat Works molds, which is very interesting. Um, so I'd like to start off, Dave. Are you unmuted? Yes, I am. Okay. 
Uh, could you would you mind just tell us a little bit about who started the company that would become Nichols and Holman? Uh, how did that happen? Kind of when did your dad build his first Lightning? And when did they build the first Lightning for a paying customer? Well, the first three boats were built by my dad, Harvey Foot, and Clark, or, uh, the Furies, who was one of my dad's crew. Anyway, they uh, had plans for 844, 1565, and 1566. Anyway, they built, started in 1945, and the first boat sailed in 1946 in June, and I'm not sure when the other two sailed, but it was soon after. But anyway, Dad did very well with the boat, and uh, eventually he was asked to build a, a boat for a first customer. And when did that, do you know what year that was? I think it was 1947, but I'm not sure. Okay. And, and how did the partnership you gotta understand that before? when when dad started the boat I was only five years old yeah I <laughs> you're testing my memory a little bit no no, no I, 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 I understand that um, but anyway the most interesting thing about the first boat that dad built commercially was that the boat had one piece redwood sides Wow. And the boat, I repaired the stem in the boat in 1967. So it lasted quite a while. And it was okay. a real challenge replacing a oak stem in a boat. And how, how did the partnership with Clarence Holman evolve? I can barely hear you. How did the partnership with Clarence Holman evolve? Clarence Holman used to sail a skimmer on Lake Benton, which is a 24 foot flat scow. Anyway, he used to drive past the house all the time and he used to stop and watch them when they were assembling the first three boats. And then after dad started building part-time the first boat for commercial sale, Clarence continued to stop. And finally they had a conversation and they, they built the first 10 boats in my dad's car garage diagonally in a two-car garage and then in November of 1950 they formed a partnership and moved to South Long Lake Road where the company was for a long time 1986. Okay. Did Nichols and Holman ever build anything other than a Lightning? The only thing that they ever built was they built 10 Shearwater catamarans in out of fiberglass in the 1960s. Okay, but other than Everything that, it was all lightning. lightning. Okay. Um, and how old were you when you started at Nichols and Holman? When I started at Nichols and Holman, I was 13 years old, and the first week out of school, I wanted a J.C. Higgins four-speed lightweight bicycle from Sears Roebuck and Company. I went to work there that first week and I retired from building lightnings in 2007. Did you get the bicycle? I had the bicycle, but so, it burned up in the garage in 2000, or no, in 1968, something like that. Okay, let me jump ahead a little bit. 1959 was a pretty good year for uh, for you, your dad, um, winning the internationals and winning at St. Pete. Um, is there anything uh, you might share with us about that experience? Well, I didn't have anything to do with this actual sailing in St. Petersburg, but I yeah. did with actually building the boat. Mm -hmm. Fact is, I still have prints in my right hand where my dad accidentally drove a staple putting the canvas deck on in the palm of my right hand. So I, I, I have that to remember all the, every day. But 
anyway, we started building 7207 in, I think it was right after the tolerances came out in August of uh, uh, 58. Mm -hmm. The boat was finished in, in uh, end of September. And I think they sailed it first time on the Bayview Halloween Regatta in Detroit. And that didn't sail again until St. Petersburg. But in, when the boat, when they sailed in St. Petersburg, Joe Stoolin from St. Joe, Michigan, was friends with Pete Bennett, who worked at Murphy and Nye. And he asked Dad if he wanted to try some new sails and they crew with him. And that's how it happened that that crew was put together. Okay. And, okay. But the North, the, the uh, internationals that were in Detroit was the two things that were interesting for me was that was Dad was really sick in 1955 and had to be flown home from the North Americans. And when they got home, they didn't figure he would ever be walking him. But he was determined beyond belief to get well. And in 19, by 1956, he finished fourth in the internationals again. And then finally by 59, he won. Very good, very good. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass the mic on over to, to Mike Seibert, who has a series of questions uh, for you. This mostly concerns the construction of, of the wooden boats at Nichols and Holman. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Dave, hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, first thing I wanted to ask you about was back, we're going to gonna do a little bit of talk about the evolution of the lightning and that'll, that'll, to some extent, be about the shape of the lightning. So I wanted to get a kind of a framework for where we all started. So in 1945, when your dad began building lightnings, what was going on with the offsets in those days? Not much of anything, because nobody knew what they were. The, the offsets from 1945, well, actually even before that, till August of 1958 were the same, and the tolerances weren't published, so that unless somebody chose to experiment and the boat didn't measure, nobody knew what they were. But in 1958 was when, and they published them in August of 58, and that's when most of the experimentation started. Okay, uh, uh, sticking with the, um, did, was that me making that noise? I'm sorry if I did. Um, back to 1945, uh, was there anything going on with the bottom arcs and, uh, you know, how they changed at some point? Not till 58. Not till 58. Because the only one that was published was 10 foot 6. Okay. What about the construction of the bottom? Well, the initial boats, the centerboard trunk and the mast step were separate. And uh, according to the lightning class rules that you could make the boat stronger, but not lighter or weaker. So my dad joined the mast step and the uh, centerboard trunk logs together to form one longer, stronger unit. And that's been continued by most builders ever since. But uh, other than that, there wasn't any changes until 58 to speak of. Uh, Going back to the way- 58 that... was when the, the frames were made a little higher to make it stronger under the- Okay, if Tom Allen's on. Mass step area, yeah. what have you. Just, just to finish up for 1945. Yeah. Uh, I understand there was a two-layer bottom that was used? Yes, it was. That was a, what they call a double flank bottom. The original Scanny Atlas Lightnings had the bottom planks were perpendicular to the center line for the inner planking and lengthwise for the outer planking. 
And then they had a layer of muslin with uh, what they call avial glue between them, which is a tar-based substance. Well, the problem with that system was that every place the planks crossed was a spot to leak. Well, my dad also was one who decided that the planks all should go the same way, both inner and outer. And every one of the outer planks overlapped the seams of the inner planks so that the boat was a dry boat when it left the shop. How much glue did they use in a boat back in those days? All I know is they used to buy it in five gallon pails. <laughs> <laughs> in order to use it, you had to heat it up. <laughs> and that was not fun. And neither was the cleanup. <laughs> I bet. Last question about 1945. Were, uh, I, at some point there became an emphasis on making the boats to the minimum weight of 700 pounds. Um, was that an emphasis by 1945? Actually, my dad's first Lightning 1565 was a 700 pound boat. And that is one of the things that helped get Nichols and Alden off the ground. Okay. It just, they, they didn't do anything special. But the other thing was, the boats didn't have to soak up water in order to sail dry. So the boat, you could travel from one regatta to another easily and just not have to worry about the boat leaking when you got. Okay. So I'm gonna switch gears now and uh, start talking a little bit about building methods that were used at Nichols and Holman to try to make the construction more efficient. And we've got, we've got on the screen, it's not very easy to see, but it's a picture of what's called the framing table. And I wanted to, to talk about the framing table. How did it come to be? When, 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 who came up with it and when was that? And how was it used? Well, I am not 100% sure how it came about, but I know how it was used because I used it for a lot of years. But basically, I think the frame table was probably built in Harvey Foote's basement in 1945, and it was used ever since. But basically what it is, is it's the layout of the outside of the frames minus the planking. And the frame table, I don't know when everything was added to it because the plans don't call for adding the deck frame at the same point that you build the frame, nor the seat braces. But Nichols and Holman I added that before I started working there. And it just continued ever since. How big is this table we're talking about? It's four by eight sheet of plywood. And okay. frames one through six are on the, the upper side of the table is the bottom or the upper part of the boat. And frames six and a half through nine are on the lower part. And that oddball shape you see with the two lines crossing at the end in the middle is the line that the seats sit on. That's the lower part of the seat board. Okay, so how exactly did you use this frame table? Well, the process of building the frame was first you had to build all the individual parts. Side frames, bottom frames, deck beams. We had patterns for everything. And we, the side frames were all just straight stock. They were all made on what they call a sticker. Like it's, it's a tool like you make trim for a house runs at high speed, so they came out the other side finished. And the bottom frames all had individual patterns, had to be cut out with a uh, bandsaw, and then they were sanded on a disc sander, so they matched the lines on the table. It's an interesting process, and when you first get started, it takes a little while, but I got so I could sand them pretty quickly. So, and so use the belt sander on the inside of the frame. And yeah. same with the, the seat braces. Uh, the lines are on the table for where you 
they stop at the centerboard truck for the ones that go from five and five and a half. And at that time, eight and eight and a half were all the way across the boat. And then the ones on six and a half and seven are, they come out to the inner edge of the seat. So you did you build the frames right on top of this table? Exactly. You started out, I always started at the back end of the boat because the frames, there's more to do at the back end and the ones at the front keep getting easier. So <laughs> as you get tired of building, working at it, the ones at the front are the, the easy ones to finish with. When you assembled the frames, did you also assemble some of the other pieces uh, of the structure? Well, I, I built those, but I, when I started building fr the frames themselves, I would do the whole set of frames before I started the other parts. Uh -huh. Because after the frames were done, at Nichols and Holman, they always put a coat of varnish on them or two before they ever went in the boat. They were, they were a uh, nail put in the side frame and they hung on bars after you varnished them to dry. So to we're there. an idea, the first set of frames that I made as far as being complicated, took me 10 and a half hours to assemble it. And I got so that I could do the whole set in two hours and 10 minutes. Well, that's pretty, pretty good compared to me. I think it took me four months to assemble my frames. <laughs> um, all right. What, did you also have a homemade jig to uh, make scarf joints? No, scarf joints were made by piling up lumber and clamping the, the lumber. We used to have several saw horses at the shop. We used to put a, a good quality plank at the bottom to keep everything straight and then clamp each one successively aft the distance that the scarf had to be. Then we had a skill electric planer that was by hand. Yeah, and uh, knocked most of the lumber off that way. And then usually finished it with a belt sander on the downside, broke side. Okay, almost done here with efficiency measures. Um, did you at some point begin sending the bottom planks out to a shop? for work before you uh, put them on the boat? When we switched from double plank to single plank boats, the Western Red Cedar used to come rough one by six. And they had a set of, they had a set of knives made that would finish and put the radius on the outside, the radius on the inside, and finish both outer edges. And one pass, you put a board feed a board into the sticker at high speed. 10 seconds later, you had a bottom plank. And it was finished so you didn't have to sand it. Okay. Um, with respect to the top side planking, I believe you uh, eventually made them in one piece, right? We started doing that first time we, we tried doing it was when you use Wellwood glue, which was a water-based glue, resin glue, and it wasn't all that great. And the other problem that happened with those, because they did them tongue and groove, that the joint used to shrink. So you could always see the line where the joint was. Well, in 1957, when the epoxy resin started coming out, we actually did the whole process with a butt joint. We did, if the boards weren't long enough, we used the scarf joint to make them longer. And then we used the butt joint to make them wide enough. And at the, after they were glued together, then we took them into a Flint Lumber Company. They were plain to just over five eighths. Then they were run through a 30 inch wide belt sander finish both sides. Used to do about a dozen of them at a time, so you had six boats worth. And 
we had a place to store them when we were done. Just do two a week. Okay, I'm going to now uh, fast forward to 1958. You talked about the fact that the class published the tolerances in 1958. And you talked about the, the boat that was eventually the championship boat in 1959 in the in internationals. I want to ask you, uh, what changes uh, Nichols and Holman made uh, after those tolerances came out to the, to the way you built the Lightning? Well, I don't know how they arrived at it, what to do, but I do know that Basically, along the center of the line of the boat, the keel was low in the bow, low under the mast up, higher under the almost maximum high. This is considering the boat right side up now. Okay. High under the, the centerboard trunk. It went through station nine to being low with the transom. The chines were narrow, the half breadths except at the transom where they were wider and the chines were maximum height. Uh, deck, I don't know very much about. What about the bottom marks? Did you use different bottom, bottom marks? on 7207 were eight foot from bow to stern. Okay. And these, this was a single plank boat, I believe. Was it the first single plank boat? 7207 was the last double plank boat made. Oh! Oh, all of them since then were single point. Okay, did you at some point, I don't know if it was at this point, but uh, I understand you made some of the high stress frames and deck beams larger to make the boat stiffer? That was done at the same time. Uh, I think that this boat was built uh, instead of making the, the plans call for everything to be an inch and a half high, but uh, stations three, three and a half, and four were the first ones that were made at two inches. And then because it was hard keeping the floorboards, we're working a program for the floorboards, we changed it so that it was that way from five, uh, three to five. So that, forward part was a half inch higher. Well, what it did is it stopped particularly number four frame from breaking. Oh. Okay. Um, well, at this point, I've just got one, one other, well, Bob. <laughs> okay. Up on the screen, we've got, uh, we've got a drawing of a router and, and part of the frame. And can you explain what that's a picture of? Basically what that is, is the router setup that we use to fit the single plank uh, boards to the bottom of the boat. And this one is one I drew for Mike a long time ago. Now, anyway, <laughs> it's, it used a half inch carbide cutter and it to run along the keel and with the garboard plank or clamp down from bow to stern you could run this along the keel and it made the edge of the garboard the same as the uh, so, so that the two fit together now there was a little bit of flashing at the bottom edge of it which you had because of the per of the side, of bottom frame but it basically took darn near 90% of the work out of fitting all the planks. Uh, Every one that you do from there out is a little bit easier because the plank, the, the plank that you're riding on and the one you're fitting are the same height. Yeah. Uh, one it, last it area. It is an epoxy oh. uh, glued butt joint. And that really, they, they go pretty quickly. When we actually built the boats, we were set up to do one plank on each side at the same time. It run down one side, we had a, 
a wire set up over the top with a bunch of pulleys on it and a cord so that it would follow right down as you use the router. When you got done, you just unplug the router and set it aside, put the, that plank on, and then you went did the next set. It gets easier as you go further outward. Because the plank gets shorter. Okay, one one last set of questions, and that is about the uh, kits that were made available by Nichols and Holman. About when was that? Was it the same design as the factory lightnings, and about how many did you sell? It's the same design as the factory lightnings, but exactly how many were sold, I don't know. I know that in 1960, about eight of them were sold. I don't really remember the kits very much before either 59 or 60. I don't, I don't that part falls, falling out of the memory banks. Okay. Okay. Bob, that will, that will do it for me. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you very much, Mike and Dave. At this point, we want to transition, uh, start talking about some glass boats. Um, just to first just touch the, the overlap between the wood and the glass boats. Um, you sold both. Um, I note in some older ads, um, as early as 1960, Nichols and Holman was, had in their advertisement mention of a glass boat. Were those actually made by Nichols and Holman or were you reselling hulls from others? Uh boat wasn't made by Nichols and Holman, but they used a Nichols and Holman boat for the plug. But the, uh, the boats were made by uh, Nelson Gherkins in Toledo, Ohio. And the original boats I know had uh, wood centerboard trunks on them. I do know about that part because I built the centerboard trunks in Master. Okay. <laughs> But I didn't build anything else. I didn't build the seats or anything else that was on. But okay. anyway, they were advertised together and I don't know that we ever sold them. I really don't. Because I, okay. I didn't own the company. I was an employee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understand. Um, but you built parts of the boats, which is interesting. Um, was there a lot of other sharing between builders or or was this a rare example of that well the only other thing i know that happened was in 1965 i didn't know where my dad and clarence were going when i know you should be going toward fiberglass but they were gun shy about doing it well they bought six lip and cot hulls mm -hmm. and did all the, we did all the hardware and everything on the boats. And one of them didn't get sold right away. Um, I sailed it for the tail of uh, well, half of a season. And but the following season, uh, was, they didn't buy anymore. Okay, and at what point did, did Nichols and Holman build its first glass mold? Well, what actually happened was that I knew we needed to go into it, and I didn't know what Clarence Holman was going to do. My dad had bought his share of the company out at that time. I mean, mm -hmm. Clarence bought my dad's share. Mm -hmm. And at least I thought he did, but it didn't happen until a little bit later. But anyway, I was going to take, wanted to take the lightning that I had at the Time, which was 91, 98, and change it into what I thought it should be from what I had remembered and seen. But then they talked uh, about it longer and longer, and finally in November of, of uh, 65, we actually built, I actually built the last wood boat, which became the plug which is the one that Joel Thurtell has that he calls Plug Nickel. Okay. I okay. built that boat in November, December of 65. Okay, so in 66 you were building glass boats. The first boat was started just 
they started building the first mold just before Christmas. Okay. We had another guy helping us because we didn't know a lot about it at the time. Okay. Uh, I learned pretty fast, and uh, the guy didn't really like it that I was learning faster than he was doing stuff. And <laughs> it only lasted about a year because the following, and after 66 was over, I started actually building the boats. Okay. Um, let's transition now to talking about Nichols Boat Works, which uh, I believe you started in 1981. Um, and you you shared with me, which I want to I want you to walk through for people. You know, we had about you sent me I think twenty some odd pictures of the, the process of building the mold and the first boat coming out. And I'd like you to quickly walk us through these photos and the process. Just let me know when to change slides. Okay, this is uh, Lightning eighty seven eighty four that belonged to a friend of mine who lived up in the middle of the state of Michigan. Anyway, he offered it to me for this process. But to go back a little further, what happened first was that there were five of us that wanted better lightnings that were being, being built at the time. And also in 1980, I sailed the worst district I'd ever sailed in my life. Wasn't very happy about it, but the five of us were Myself, my brother George, and my brother Louie, and then two other members, Murray Gushin and uh, Paul Cavanaugh from Lake Fenton. Anyway, we had a meeting at my brand new pole barn, which is what this is in, on September 15th of 1980, and came up with a plan to build all the plugs, all the molds, in five boats with the idea of having all of them sail, sailing by July 15th. It's a pretty ambitious plan, considering that everybody had regular jobs. But anyway, this boat came to my house on the 30th of September. And on October 1st, Catherine Fury, who was a measure for the lightning class, where her husband was the actual one who was registered as a measurer, but she did all the measuring. She and I measured the boat, find out it doesn't do what I want. So the plan was to strip the bottom and the keel and change everything to what the plan that I wanted. And this is the actual process. Everything that's inside the under the keel is all braced and so that it stays put. And then the clamps are adding pieces to the frame to change the arcs. And then you can see the four pieces of new wood in the back. That's station five and a half or, or six and seven. That uh, those, those wood, that wood was so rotten that we just threw it away, put new ones in. You need to turn the page. Okay. This is just a close up of the same thing. Now I know that here's where you were adding wood to change, change this, the arc. This is to change the arc from a flatter, like 14 foot arc, so that this part of the boat can be an 8 foot arc. Okay. A little more of the same thing. You notice there's no true arcs on any of the frames. Well, what I did was I made a jig that started out working with the eight foot ones with a router and then changed the jig to do all the ones that would go down to 12 and back to eight. Okay. Dave, we have a question here from uh, Bob Sten, second, from, uh, who's from Nyack, I believe. Um, how did it compare to the specs? Uh, where is it high and low uh, in terms of the, the, the bottom that you built? Well, you... all I can tell you is the whole boat was so far off from what I wanted that was just there wasn't any option. But it, it was high on the ends. It was uh, uh, deep in the middle. 
Mm -hmm. The trunk, the whole thing had to be lowered and changed. The only place that was somewhat where I wanted to go was near the transom. Okay, and how did you? The other, the only other thing that was right was the boat was on was narrow, like what I okay. wanted. Okay, that's about the only thing that was right. Okay, this is just my brother being in a calm. We had a little fun along the way. <laughs> okay, and that's a 1969 Chevrolet in the back. <laughs> This is after the boat has been replanked and the new keel put on. The uh, it's waiting for the next step after this one. You need to change the picture now. Okay. Well, hold on. Let me go back because I got another question. Why the notch on the right? Okay, that must be referring to this. That's a oh. linder hole for in the wood boat to let water pass between the frames okay. when the boat is healed. Okay. There's one under another frame forward if you noticed it. Okay. This was another thing we discovered after I remeasured, after Catherine came back and we remeasured the boat. The boat wasn't out to maximum length. So I scarfed Western Red Cedar on the bow to get it back to where I wanted, or to get it where I wanted, I should say. But okay. that's all just epoxy glued on there and, and hand shaped. Question: Obviously, the shape of the boat is is very important, and, and obviously you've given a lot of thought to it. How did you decide how you wanted the boat to be in terms of its length and the, and the arcs and, and where it's high and where it's low? Well, I had a few years. After I left Nichols and Holman and before I started Nichols Boat Works, where I spent time repairing boats mostly for a living, but I still repaired numerous lightnings. And some of them I had to turn over. And when I did, I turned, I measured some of the ones that I knew I couldn't beat regularly. Mm -hmm. Wanted to know what the difference was. Okay. That's how I basically discovered what I wanted. Okay, interesting. And what do we have in this picture? This is just a part of the finishing work and shows the boat with the skeg added on. The skeg on a fiberglass boat is tapered vertically because you need it narrower at the bottom than the top. It needs to have draft to get it out of the mold. I am not sure that I have these in the right order, but uh, the, the wood, the end grain of the planks wouldn't seal well. So what we did was we uh, put a stick along the side and we put a uh, edge grain board down the actual edge of the ends of the planks, right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. In order to get the end grain to seal so that it wasn't any problem. That would be like about here. That's where it was done. Yeah. Okay. And that's just taking a rest. Because you get tired <laughs> <after a> while. <laughs> this is the actual mock up start of building the centerboard trunk in the boat. I believe the next picture is a little yeah. bit further along. That's a single construction centerboard trunk, so there isn't any chance of uh, leaking. We had to, in order to build it, had to build one side at a time because you, you can't have an overlap when you're actually making the part. Okay. And the original ones had winches in them, and yeah. we built the pieces right on the trunk to uh, the forward one, the uh, Jib downhaul was on one side or up haul, whichever way you used it. Mm -hmm. And the boom bang was on the opposite side. So this was turned into, this was used as a plug then that you built the mold off of. This is the actual plug. Okay. It's gone now. Okay. This is my friend Paul Cavanaugh. Uh, he and I are the ones that actually were the best at the final finish. And we spent 
hours upon hours making this boat look the way it did. And that boat that you see, the bow, the blue one, that's an Allen boat that I was repairing for somebody at Pontiac. Oh, which? Oh, this one. Okay. That the bow of that lightning is. Yeah. I can't remember who owned the boat. I think it was the the McKinley brothers. Mm -hmm. Now, just to the right and behind that sea scout is that octagonal table. That's the table that we had our meeting at in order to come up with a plan to do this. The uh, load is just the next notch forward of getting ready to to gel coat to make the mold. And this is what it looked like but we had tar paper on the floor because you get overspray and uh, had a, we masked off the bottom because the sides of the mold were black and the bottom of the boat was orange. And it, what it did is it made a part line to know where to put stripes. This is with it masked off and the sides are all are done in black. And then the next step was to take that uh, masking paper and plastic off the bottom. Then the whole thing was sprayed over even the black with orange gel coat. And this is after that's been done with two layers of what you call angel hair, which angel hair prevents print through in the mold. And that part that's sticking up in the middle and the book this That's picture? the bottom of the part that locates, eventually will locate the centerboard crump in the, mm -hmm. in the mold. That's how it was anchored into this, in the mold. This is just doing one of the seven laminates after the, of the process. And it's all, it was all done by hand. All the resin was rolled on and then my brother George in the blue shirt was the, the best that rolling that we had, so they would use the hook. I mean, most of the time it was all five of us doing this. And just put the resin on with the paint roller, get as much air out as you can, and then roll the air out, the final air out with the aluminum thin roller. Then what you have to do is you have to make a frame that goes over the whole thing that will eventually add support to the whole system. And that's all uh, electrical conduit, all hand shaped and welded together with a stick welder. I didn't have a, a, a MIG welder at the time. another view of the same thing mm -hmm. from the bow. Now was your was your mold mounted in something that could be rotated or, or was it just fixed? Well if you look at the front end there's a right there that is a piece of pipe of inch and a quarter pipe or inch pipe welded between the top and the bottom and there's set screws in the side and the reason I made it that way was I didn't know for sure where it had to be in order so you could turn it over. Mm -hmm. One of those on the stern and one at the bow. And basically I built a set of uh, lifts that had a uh, hand crank on them that lifted two to one. And then what we did was to finalize it was we set those set screws up tight until we discovered where it needed to be and then afterward welded it in place. Okay. And surprisingly enough, the one at the stern has to be right near the keel. Hmm. Oh. This is actually taking the first boat out of the mold. Basically it's hooked up to a chain fall in the mycelium mm -hmm. and you have to break the boat loose while it's done with both air and water. 
and usually the first one is, can be a little bit of a problem getting it out. As the mold breaks in, they come out pretty easy. But that one bar wood piece of wood across there is a spreader bar because otherwise there's no support like when the deck is on the boat. You have to keep it separated so you don't break anything. Now the centerboard trunk must have been two molds, one for each side? It's two molds and it has wood pieces in the center that space it. Okay. And afterwards it's dished out and then there is a fiberglass mat is what goes in there. Okay. Put it in narrower pieces in first and wider pieces at the end so you get it covered. Then you have to, we had to hand finish that okay. in all the boats. That's it coming out? This is just coming out of the mold. And that's uh, myself and my brother George and Paul. And the one on the left is Brian that received his dad's. Uh, honorary, I think, what are the bells that we got. Okay. And the fellow in the wheelchair is a fellow that lives about a quarter mile down the road that had polio. But we're very good friends because he's a speech teacher at Holly. My wife teaches at Holly. Okay. And he kept track of everything. He used to come down and wheel himself around in a shop and pay t keep attention all attention on what we're doing all the time. That shows you how determined a person can be. And the, the boat on the right is 13617 was the first one. I didn't sail the boat. Well, you had some pretty good talent on the boat. I, I was not <laughs> unhappy with the people that were sailing. <laughs> I think they finished second in the regatta, but they have, there was a few problems when, that we didn't know about that were pretty minor, but yeah. they had to be taken care of. Yep. Eventually, everything turned out fine. Okay. Um, a couple more things. Let me just leave it here. I just, another question I'd like to ask, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, a lot of those early Nichols Boatworks boats are still sailing today, still competitive. What made them so good? What What did you do differently that other people weren't doing at the time? Because those boats are still competitive. I, I owned a well, couple I, of them. I think that the shape of the boat is pretty darn good for longevity. But also, the other thing is that when we, when we first built the boat, the first, I think, 18 or 19 were urethane foam. Mm -hmm. And even though they were, what the situation was, I, I told my brother, I said, what we have to do is we have to do make every effort to keep water off from the foam. Mm -hmm. So even all the foam that was in the inside the tanks from underneath you know, on the halves of the bottom, the bottom of the seats, bottom of the floorboards, mm -hmm. everything was all glassed and sealed. Before it got together, there was nothing exposed. And I think okay. that's the main reason why most of them. And even when we changed foam in 1983, I think it was. The day the guy ran the phone, the uh, thing over my hand when I was demonstrating. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it was 13815 was the first one we built with the uh, modified PVC phone or the Venisol at the time. That phone, the difference between the phones is the Venisol is closed cell cross linked. Urethane foam is closed cell, but it's not cross-linked. The difference is if you think of a bowl of, or a bunch of marbles in a fish bowl, water can get in between all the cells. Mm -hmm. Well, in urethane foam, 
that's what happens. Okay. And eventually it just gets in there and there's no way to get it up. I mean, it right. might be that if you took a boat that was heavy and parked it in Death Valley all summer, that might be able to get the water off. I wouldn't count on it. Okay, I got a, another question. This came from Craig Fair, um, who also has one of your, uh, I think, 14, seven something boats. Uh, and of course, he has a, an old Woody, an old Skinny Atlas boat as well. Um, Yes, was the shape of, of the boat modified over the course of production of, of the glass boats? The hull shape was never modified while I owned the company, but it okay. was after I sold it to Hugh Armour. Okay, and that's where they came out with the whole, with the new deck that design? That was when we saw the change in the deck, the hull was modified at the same time. Okay, okay. Uh, if anybody else has any other questions, please, uh, send them in. What was the last glass boat, I guess, number uh, that you built before you sold to Hugh? I'm not actually sure, but the last glass boat, I, I sold the shop in August of 1999. Okay. August 23rd of 1999. Okay. But I don't remember what the number was. Okay. Um, but you still had some involvement while you had transitioned into ownership, is that correct? I didn't hear what you said. Did you still have some involvement with, with the company after you sold it to Hugh for some I worked time? for Hugh until 2007, and we had uh, differences of opinion like I did with Clarence a long time okay. ago. And I just eventually just retired. Okay. Okay. I was 60. I was almost 67 when I retired. Well, <laughs> you're certainly entitled to retirement. I did it myself a couple of years ago, and and uh, and I'm still doing work for my former employer too. Um, okay, if nobody else has any other questions. I want to personally thank you so much for your time today. Um, oh, got another question. Sorry. Um, was there a point uh, that you made the deck lighter? No. The only thing that happened with the deck was the first deck we made out of PVC foam mm -hmm. wasn't quite stiff enough because when you walked on it, it wasn't, it, if you weren't a feather, it tended to oil cam a little bit. Okay. So but we there was changed no... it a half inch. But, but there was no that, major change. Pretty well stayed the same. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, again, Dave, I want to thank you. Mike, thank you very much for your help in, in putting all this together. Um, I, I think this has been interest, very interesting to me. I uh, hope some others. Um, and Dave, I hope you'll come join us uh, when and if we do another session that the, the delves into the transition from wood to glass boats. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope we can put that together. Um, oh. Not going anywhere. Okay, okay good. Now, hold on. Uh, one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, was there much difference in the hull shape? Well, I'm not sure between knuckle the Nichols and Allen. Okay, so you're asking is there a lot of difference in the hull shape? And, and maybe that answer is, is, over, is an overtime question. Um, was there much difference in the hull shape between the Nichols boats and the Allen boats? The biggest difference between the two boats is the Allen boats are a little flatter in the stern. And from what I get listening to most of the better sailors talking about it, is if you're sailing small lakes, they like the Nichols boat better. If you're sailing on larger water, they like the Allen boat better. And the difference is, is that the Nichols boat tends to accelerate faster when you have a lot of short tacking to do. But the Allen boat steers a little easier when you're going upwind and long, longer tacks. And how big a difference I mean, obviously the tolerances are the toler are not all that wide, so this is really small differences. They're very small. Okay. Okay. 
All right. Well, I'm going to let everybody go. And again, I want to thank everybody, particularly you and, and Mike, for all your help in this. And, uh, thank you, Bob and Dave. Day. And then, Laura, do you have anything to say at the end here? Nope, I am all set. Thank you, guys. It was a great uh, afternoon. Thank you, Bob, Dave, and Mike. Mike, you guys did a great job. Um, I can't thank you enough. Have a great, great. Okay. Everybody have a great holiday weekend. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.